So good to see you. How are you? Troubling times, yeah? It's like my, um, my second son, the younger one, says to me this week, um, wow, Dad, just when the pandemic's going away, now there's a war. And I was like, I'm so sorry, son. It's like, we are just full of sin. And um, it's sad, but it's the world we live in. Um, and, you know, moments like this make you wonder, like, what, what do we do? Like, what, how, how is our gathering like this relevant? Um, and then how do we even have service and move on? Um, we don't. We, we don't do it for us, and we don't have hope in us. We have hope in the Lord. And our hope, um, and it's not wishful thinking, our confidence, I should say, is that the Lord is still in control, and he will have his way, especially in the end. Amen? And then all suffering will go away, and, and justice will prevail, and the light will overcome all darkness. That's my hope, and that's our confidence as the people of God. And so in many ways, uh, we're saying, God, do whatever you want to do in us, collectively as a church, not just Christians here, but Christians in Ukraine, Christians all over the world, that if your people who are called by your name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Maybe, oh, just maybe, you will heal the lands that we live in. It's not a maybe, it's a promise. You guys should have been like, oh, I know where it's getting at. So even though we're like, oh, we're working on ourselves, we're inviting God to, to uh, teach us and groom us and grow us, what does that have to do with anything? It has a lot to do with everything. For even wars, you know, this, this cancer that we see in public started somewhere as a small little cancer, as a small little sin and rebellion. And it's when God's people pray and repent and get rid of these things that these big catastrophes and darkness will not prevail. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that um, in the midst of all this, you still have uh, a purpose. You still have uh, um, your way, and, and, and you are wise. And we just we don't know how things are going to work out, but we do know that you are strong and you are wise. And so, Lord, we want to just say, as we listen to your word, um, it's not our way of escaping the world, but it's our way of entrusting the world to you. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're in the book of Ezra, as you know. Uh, God's people have uh, returned from captivity, from exile, and they are now rebuilding the temple of God. Uh, they have rebuilt uh, at least laid the foundation down and they're rebuilding the altar of God. And we examined and wrestled a lot with this idea of restoring worship, restoring our identity as the people of God and restoring the activities of the people of God in a way that's authentic and righteous. And our hope is that post-pandemic, as we're returning, that our church will not return to usual. Our church will not return to just church as usual. But we will return with a commitment and a resolve to rebuild a holy temple of God. That post-pandemic echo will look stronger, brighter, and holier than ever before. Amen? So it is with that I read chapter 3 of Ezra, and you, you, we will go over this over and over again, and you'll see. And it says in verse 4, Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles. Now they are restoring the festivals, guys, with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon of us. Uh, sacrifices and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord as well as those brought as free will offerings to the Lord on the first day of the seventh month they began to 
uh, offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. This is the word of the Lord. And I get to today's problem. So indulge me here. Ready? When we do not know what counts as worship unto the Lord, it leaves us feeling dissatisfied and demoralized. Although we want to worship and express our love to God, we are often unsure how and when it has occurred acceptably. Also, the absence of God's agricultural time signatures has left us disoriented and has, chasing, uh, has us chasing a very Gnostic, disembodied faith. All of which adds to the insecurity of not knowing for sure if we have loved and worshipped God well. We just, we just don't know for sure. That is why we will spend several weeks examining the sacred festivals that the people of God were directed to do in the book of Leviticus and which the rebuilders of God in Ezra are reinstating in chapter 3. Do you guys get this? Okay. The festivals were prescribed in Leviticus and in chapter 3 of Ezra we now see them reinstating all these worship festivals in their attempt to worship God adequately and accurately. We will glean from each prescribed festival translated for our time so that in doing so, we will have a much clearer idea of what worship is, leaving us more confident and energized in our love for God. Do you understand the problem? The problem is, we don't know what worship literally is. We recognize worship institutions and buildings, but we don't know what literally an expression of worship is. The people of God did at this time, and so they are reinstating what has been prescribed to them before. But for us, when we say, let's worship God with all of our heart, we say, yeah. That's what we say. And, and, and the closest thing to is something tangible or a list of to-dos will go, worship is probably singing. And so we'll say things like, uh, 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 man, uh, I, I love the worship today. And what we, what we mean by that is, I love the songs that we sang. And that's not, that's not bad. Those are expressions of worship. But how do we know for sure if we've worshiped well? And because we don't know for sure, our week just feels disoriented and we're demoralized. We're de-energized. We don't know if we're worshiping well. If you've ever been in love, and most of you have been in love, right, hopefully, if you've not been in love, you're not human, okay? But if you've been in love, you know one of the great satisfactions of being in love is that you know for sure you are loving your spouse well. When you've hit the mark, when you've done something tangible, when you've said something that's very clear and articulate, you've done something and your spouse responds, oh yeah, a lack of how you love me. And then you're like, yeah, I love that I loved you well today, right? But then what if every week your spouse, and some of you guys are like, you're about to explain my marriage. Uh, what if every week your spouse is like, you just, you just frustrate me. You're just not loving me well. And then you're like, darn it, woman, I don't know how to love you well. What do you mean love? And she's like, just love. Just, I want you to love me. Love me. And all of you men right now are like, I too hear those cryptic messages. I have yet to decipher and decode them, right? And then women, I know, I'm going on a sidetrack, but women, we know, we, we, not we, you guys know, you guys also know that you're like, it is not love if I have to explain it to you. And you're like, but it is love because I have to know what you really want. And then she goes, what? You need to figure it out. And you're like, ah, I lost. <laughs> But the truth is, in, in Scripture, God does explain it to us. God doesn't leave us confused. God doesn't leave us directionless. He tells us what he wants. Can I get an amen? 
And he does that because he knows loving him well, loving him accurately, doing things that he likes, not only glorifies him, but energizes us. Amen? So, first of all, what the heck is up with all these appointed sacrifices and festivals? Where are we getting them from? We're getting them from Leviticus chapter 23. In the next eight weeks, everyone say eight weeks. We're going to stay right here. Right here. Why? Why, PB? Why? Are you, just trying to, are you just trying to make Ezra longer? No. Ezra's long enough. Okay? What are we, why are we doing this? Because there are eight festivals. And Ezra says all festivals, all sacred assemblies were reinstated. So I want to go through all of them. Because I believe that all of them, if translated well, we too will be empowered with a very clear vision of what worship is. Amen? So just hang with me for the next eight weeks. Somebody like, hey, what, what chapter of Ezra are you in now at the church? Just say chapter 3 forever. We're in chapter 3 forever. Leviticus 23 says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed festivals. Here they are. Here they are. Okay? The appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. And then he lists them. He gives them the assemblies. He gives them the sacred gatherings. And then he explains to them what he wants in them. He's literally telling them when to meet and why to meet and what to bring when you meet. So clear. So nice of him. Yeah? So here are the eight festivals. Oh, there they are already. Right? The Festival of Unleavened Bread, Festival of Tabernacles, Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Pentecost, Passover, First Fruits, and the Sabbath. And some of you guys are like, Sabbath is a festival? Yes, we'll get to that at the very end. Sabbath is the one festival that happens every week. Okay? So within these festivals, if we do it right, I believe we will get some major hints to how to worship God in our time. Now, all the festivals, all of them commemorate and point to the deliverance from Egypt. So before I move on, the basis for all of our gathering is the deliverance from slavery. The reason why you and I get together is not just to have a good time. You and I get together at every type of gathering, every type of sacred gathering is designed to celebrate and commemorate the fact that Jesus Christ saved you and I from sin. Can I get an amen? That is the foundation. That is the basis of all gatherings. We don't gather on the foundation of any other foundation but the the fact that Jesus Christ delivered us from sin and death. Amen? Amen? So now the Festival of Unleavened Bread, because that's what we're going to go into today, okay? We're going to go one at a time, and today we're going to go under, uh, we're going to go for Unleavened Bread, and then next week we're going to go into Festival of Tabernacles, and so on and so on. So Festival of Unleavened Bread, Leviticus chapter 23, we go from verse 4. Now he's about to explain to us the Unleavened Bread Festival. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. So he's now talking about the festival of Passover, okay? And then on verse 6, on the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. So the festival of unleavened bread is the festival celebrating bread without yeast. Okay, and we're going to explain that to you. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Seven days, present a food offering to the Lord. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. What is the festival of unleavened bread. What's going on and what's up with leaven and not having leaven and not having yeast and all that? Leaven is yeast, okay? And yeast, yeast is what 
makes your bread nice and fluffy. Isn't this, doesn't this look delicious? I'll, I'll, let me tell you if it's delicious. It's so delicious. This is from, where is this from? 84C, okay? Now, when you look at 84C bread, okay? I'm just kidding. You PB, you don't even know. It's 85C, okay, calm down, okay? When you look at bread, regular bread, made with yeast, it's made for the purpose of sustenance and satisfaction. Catch this. When you eat bread with yeast in it, okay, or leaven in it, it fluffs up and it makes it all tasty and enjoyable. And you eat it, you eat it for satisfaction and sustenance. I hope you catch this, okay? But then in the festival of unleavened bread, the Lord said, don't do that. Don't be eating stuff like this. Instead, oh, wow. Instead, make bread without any yeast. Make unleavened bread. And when you look at this, if you're like me, you go, it's not attractive. (laughs) Right? Men, you you work at a cafe. Imagine every day serving this with your coffee. Hi, here's some unleavened bread (laughs) with a nice latte. People be like, no, get that thing away from me. Right? Now watch this. Now, when you eat this, actually, if you're fat like me, this is really good, actually. (laughs) A little jam. You put a little jam, you get some unleavened jam in there. Sorry. So, when you eat this, when you eat this, Jane, you don't eat this for sustenance and satisfaction. You eat this because it points to something. You don't eat this for satisfaction, you eat this for remembrance. It is a symbol, it is a symbol. It's to get you to think about something. This is to get you to think about nothing. This is to get you, this is comfort food. This is to get you stress-free. This is to get you thinking about something, okay? Where does this come from? Exodus chapter 12, verse 17. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then he instructs the people of God to slaughter a lamb. We'll get to that festival of Passover. It gets them to slaughter the lamb, right? This is in Egypt. And it gets the blood. They dip it. And they paint the doorpost. And death passes over them, right? And then we get to verse 33. The Egyptians now, they're devastated because of what God has done to their, their land. And what God has done to set his people free because of, of Pharaoh's stubbornness. In verse 33, the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. Basically, get the heck out. You guys, the more you guys are here, the more we keep you here, the more destruction befalls us. So the Egyptians are, get out, leave. 39, with the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because... They had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Why? Why during this festival that Ezra chapter 3 is reinstating, the people now know, okay, during this time, we ain't eating no Babylonian type of 1885C bread, right? During this time, we're reinstating this worship where we're eating this. And when they're eating this, they're remembering the fact that God delivered them from Egypt. They're remembering the fact that they were once slaves. And they're remembering the fact that they had to do it in a hurry. And because God was delivering them and it was happening in an instant, right? Overnight, they were saying, get out. And they're like, okay. They didn't have time to make it fluffy and nice. Come on, somebody. 
So every time they look at this, they go, this is not for enjoyment. This is for remembrance. There was a time God delivered us and we ran for our lives to freedom. Come on, somebody. And this is evidence of it. This is a metaphor for it. This is a symbol that points us to it. Yeah? But what, is it, what else does it resemble? For the Jewish people, and then for Christians, this kind of bread, bread made with yeast and leaven, represented a life of sin. It represented all things Egypt, all things Babylon, all things empires of this world, all things fruit of the flesh. This is sin. This is life under oppression. This is enslavement. This is what scripture will call the old life. But before I move on, this is also representing any and all things that contribute, that contribute to a society or a world where dehumanizing other human beings is okay. Let me say, let me say it this way before we move on. All sin not only separates you from God, all sin eventually leads to dehumanizing others and seeing them less than human, less than being made in the image of God. So when you keep leaven in your life, you not only hurt your life with God, you eventually hurt other lives or contribute to regimes and empires that see people however they want to see them. So we find leaven is really, really bad. Amen? So how did the Hebrew people, what did they do with leaven during this time? Right? Well, it says in Exodus 12, this is a day you are to commemorate for generations to come. You shall celebrate as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is supposed to go on and on and on, this type of worship. Okay, every year, for seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your house. How did they literally prepare and literally worship God? And what was Ezra chapter 3 doing? What did they expect when they reinstated all the festivals, including the festival of unleavened bread. What were they doing? They knew, okay, there, there's going to come a time when we do this every year where we have to go and remove yeast and leaven from our house. Literally, physically. Okay? So they went around and they looked for leaven and they removed it. They didn't consume any leaven. Okay? And then what the Hebrews did was they eventually washed Walls and ceilings and floors and furnitures and cabinets, cooking ware. Everything was boiled. Everything that leaven touched, they boiled it. They cleaned it. It was a symbolic gesture saying, we don't want any type of sin and anything that resembles Egypt in our homes. Any type of sign, any type of behavior, any type, a type of thought that resembles the old regime. We don't want it in our house. So they cleaned the house. Let me say it this way. Festival of unleavened bread is much like spring cleaning. Every year they cleaned the house. I hope you catch this. This is a very embodied practice. Remember, the big problem of the day is we don't know how to embody our worship. I'm trying to get there. Do you feel it? Huh? Well, how did the modern Jews do it? The modern Jews right now, you know how they celebrate this? They actually uh, will leave leaven crumbs around the house. Right? Sorry, worship team. Okay? And during this festival, the kids and the parents will go around and look for the crumbs, right? As part of their festival, as part of their, as their part of their act of worship, they'll walk around the house and look for crumbs. And as they clean house with their kids, literally, 
they are saying to God, we also would like to get rid of all sinful behavior before you. Right? And then together as a family, they'll pray and they'll say, God, but we also know that we probably have crumbs in the house that we were not able to find. And so, Lord, forgive us also for leaven that's unseen or uncleaned. Basically, it's an act of humility. We too have everything in us to create another Pharaoh. Hello? Christ followers today. Ephesians 4. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you've learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Get rid of your leaven, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. For Christians, we do the same. We put off, we practice putting off the old ways. And we practice putting on the new life. Now, I want to be very clear. We don't don't cleanse ourselves. We We can't atone for ourselves. Okay? We also can't fall in love with new practices of the new self by ourselves. We need God's heart. We need a new heart. But the act... And the the faith practice of putting on what we know to be good and holy and part of the new identity in Christ. That act, that faith act, and that faith practice, that itself is worship. I hope you catch this. That itself is the bowing down to the new way. That itself is saying to him, I submit to the new life. And in this way, I'm telling you that I reject the old life and I accept your life, however bad I'm at it. But this is my acceptable act of worship. I am practicing, Lord. That's worship. Amen? So unleavened bread, what we learn from this season is that we are all called to worship God through spiritual spring cleaning. And so that's what Ezra was doing in chapter 3. As they're rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the altar, okay, they were calling everybody to an act of worship. And that act of worship is the act of repentance or the removal of sins. Removal of sinful thinking, removal of sin, sinful, sinful feelings, and removal of sinful acts. And all of you right now, many of you right now are like, that's a very hard thing to discover. That's a very hard thing to pinpoint, PB. I want to tell you right now, if you spend just five minutes in reflection before God, you will be able to pinpoint some of them right away. The Holy Spirit will begin to show you these these leavens should not be in your house. And you know it's contributing to something evil, something destructive, or something dehumanizing. You know it. And if you want to worship God well, you will do this practice of getting rid of leaven in your life. So, how do we do this corporately? And I really wish to make this so practical for you today, okay? How do we do this as a church? Okay? I just ask them, say how. 
Oh, do you want to know how? I'm going to tell you right now. You know how we do it practically? I'm sorry, corporately? You know how? You know how? You know how? We join the saints around the world as one church. And we repent together this week, starting this week on Ash Wednesday. You think this is just some festival or just some nice church calendar thing we're doing? No, the church worldwide are getting together to repent before God and to look for leaven and get rid of it. Because we don't want to be guilty of contributing to a society that leads to things like wars. Come on, somebody. For us, it's this Tuesday, not because we are more eager and holier, but it's because we don't have this space on Wednesday, okay? That's, that's why we're doing it, because okay, this church needs their Ash Wednesday time, so we're going to do it on Tuesday, but you're going to have that Ash Cross before everyone, and you can brag about it, okay? You can be like, I got my Ash Cross before you, I am holier. All right, so we're going to get together on Ash Wednesday, and we're going to spend time repenting and acknowledging our sins, confessing them, and gratefully accepting the Good Friday that's about to come. And that's a corporate expression of worship. PB, how do I know if I've been worshiping? How do I know if I'm worshiping with the people of God? Come to Ash Wednesday, Tuesday. And corporately engage. Come here ready to repent with the body of Christ, not just for your sins, but the church's sins. Right? That we in many ways have harbored leaven in our lives as a church and as the corporate universal church. And in many ways we have contributed to a lifestyle that Pharaoh would really like. And that's what we're repenting about together. Amen? So I want to see you come together this Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, right? And, and, and we're going to give our ashes to the Lord. Do you guys remember the trumpets, ashes, and tears? We're going to give our regretful things. We're going to give the things that we wish we didn't do. We're going to give the things we should have done. And we're going to give it to God and say, we repent. Please cleanse us. Please forgive us. Please remove the leaven in our house. And as we repent... We worship you. But then now we go into 40 days of Lent right after Tuesday, Wednesday, right? And we have the season of Lent when the church itself now, during that season, is trying to get rid of all leaven as we head towards Good Friday and Easter. So now the question remains, How do I now worship God through the festival of unleavened bread myself? I now know how to do it corporately. I need to just arrive here and participate and corporately repent together. But how do I do it as an individual? This is how you do it. You first search for leaven yourself. Look for the leaven in your life. Look for the yeast. Okay? Scripture says, examine me, God. Look at my heart. Put me to the test. Know my anxious thoughts. Look to see if there are any idolatrous way in me and lead me on the eternal path. PB, how do I literally worship God? You take time to let the Holy Spirit examine your heart and examine your life and your lifestyle. What does this mean? You actually have to make some time for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Okay? Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit can speak to you at any time of the day, right? But it's an act of humility and a gesture, right, of submission if you make time and say, Holy Spirit, tonight at 10 p.m., I like to do some examining and looking for some leaven in my life. Meet me here tonight, Lord. I come to you. And then 10 p.m. that night, you come, to, you come to the Lord every day during Lent. And you say, search me, O God. See if there's anything that I've done that's been birthed out of anxiety and fear and greed. Lord, show me any, any patterns or behaviors in my life that have been built 
on sin. Show me even things that I think are good for me or good for my family. If they have been birthed out of anxiety and fear, show me. For I want to get this cancer removed. It's not the pastor's job. It's not the worship leader's job. It's my job. And this is my acceptable act of worship to you, is cleaning house. If worship was honoring somebody, it's very honoring to get rid of crap in your house when you have a guest dwelling with you. Come on, somebody. We can't just say, Lord, come into my life, dwell in me, dwell in our church, dwell in our land, and heal our land. And then when he comes and when he visits, when he dwells with us, we say, I hope you don't mind the mess. No, the act of worship is, oh, I've been trying my best to get rid of the mess, for I honor you. Search me, oh God. Spend time. Okay? And then as you search, okay, as you search, you're asking this question. Okay, you're like, PB, how do I ask this? How do I know what's leaven and what's not? Okay? I'm going to tell you right now. There's this, uh, you guys know about this, this lady. I don't think she's that popular anymore, but there was a time this, this petite Japanese lady was, was like a rock star in cleaning house. Her name was what? Marie, Con- is it Marie Kondo? Marie Kondo. And I looked up a program. I said, oh, she, she good at this stuff. She good at getting rid of stuff. If you've ever watched her show, you want to get rid of everything, right? And there's five ways, she says, you should declutter your house. But I'm not going to talk about all five. I have a a number three. The third thing that she tells you to do as you clean house, as you do spring cleaning, she says, keep only the things that spark joy, right? Right? And she does that in the show. She goes like, I'm going to do this about joy. Right? And then they're like, yeah, this sparks joy in my life, yes. And then you keep it. And then anything that doesn't spark joy, even if it's brand new, even if it's kept well, you got to throw it away. So the examine question I wanted you to ask yourself as you worship the Lord through the festival of unleavened bread, how it teaches us, okay, is this. It's not, does it spark joy in me? As a Christian, you ask, does this spark joy in God? That's the primary question, uh, question as a Christian. Okay? Does this relationship spark joy in God? Or how we behave in it, does it spark joy in God? Okay? The way I talk to my kids, the way I talk to my coworkers, the way God will begin to show you, and then he, the Holy Spirit will show you, that gives me life. I love it when that happens. And then the Holy Spirit, as you examine and examine with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will show you, that doesn't give me life. So as you declutter, starting this week, okay, some of you literally need to declutter. Go home and start decluttering. And as you do that, make it a practice. Lord, show me your ways. Show me why my house is like this, <laughs> literally. Right? And then as we do, also show me what's up with me. And then show me what sparks joy in you, and I'll keep that, and what doesn't, and I'll remove that. Okay? Number two, how do you worship the Lord this way? You confess your leaven. First John says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us. From all sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Can I get an amen? Do you want to worship God? Don't just examine yourself with the Holy Spirit. Confess. Confess the things you find. Confess it to people you love and trust. Confess it to God. And then if you have people around you, confess it to each other. Right now, this is kind of embarrassing to say, but my wife and I, we, um, there, there is a rat in our house. 
It's weird because I feel like it's our sin that brought this. <laughs> and every morning we look for this rat. We look for this. Is it a rat or a mice? I hope it's not a rat. We look for this hamster. <laughs> and, 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 and the first thing we, we say or we ask in the morning is, did you find it? Is it caught? Right? Now, why are we saying this? Do we say this to embarrass each other? No, we both live there. It's probably both of our faults that this hamster's there, right? So, no. When we, did you find it? Is it there? What are we asking? Did we catch the leaven? There is joy in catching the leaven. It's not supposed to be shameful. Come on, somebody. Yes, it's disgusting. <laughs> yes, it's dirty right now. Every morning we don't find this hamster. What we find is it's leftover little droplings. It's so gross. It's like taunting us every morning. We have laid so many sticky pads everywhere, right? And we see droplings all around it going like, you think you got me. You stupid, you think you got me. And it's like leaving all these shrubs. And we ask each other, did it get caught? And when we are looking for the day where we can say, it's here. It's right here. And we celebrate the removal of this leaven. Come on, somebody. The church has to become like this. We have to be able to tell each other, I, caught, I found the leaven in my life. Before it becomes a cancer in your life. Most often we share when it becomes a cancer in our life. And most of us are like, oh, it's too late, dude. <laughs> it's, I, we don't, I don't know what I can do. for. I can't help you. Worship is looking for the leaven early enough so that you can share it with others and go, look, I found it. Can you pray for me that I don't, I don't live the life that brings this kind of leaven back? Finally, get rid of it. Clean up, get rid of it like the Jews did. Find your leaven, confess it, shed light on it, and then get rid of all leaven in your life. All things that separate you from God and that, that contributes to the pharaohs and the e Egypts and the Babylons of this world. Get rid of it. Okay? Now, we live in America. I'm almost done here, guys. We live in America where it's so easy to point out the leaven in other people. That's not worship. God did not say, worship me by looking for the leaven in your brother's life. Okay? That's not what he said. We don't come home every day and go, honey, I got to talk to you about that brother. That brother got some leaven. I found three today. The minute he started talking, leaven just, spit, just spills out of his mouth. We, what is it about us? We love it when others have a lot of leaven. Do not point out the leaven in someone else. Look for the leaven in you and remove it in this season. That is your worship to the Lord. That is your worship to the Lord. It is so tangible. It is so clear. Baby, I want to worship God this week. Look for leaven and get rid of it. Look for every habit, every word, everything you do. And then clean it up. So I want to show you this. Okay, and, and we'll close here and we'll pray. All right. And then, um, are we taking communion today? Yeah? We are, all right? You guys have your communion? We should do that. Okay. But this represents the lemon, right? leaven, right? So we got all this leaven. And God says to get rid of the leaven. And then now we see, oh, this is so dangerous. You see, you guys see this? This is a mouse trap. This is one thing we don't have, honey. You know why my wife and I don't have this one? Because we don't want to find it in here. It's so, it's so gross. We're hoping that we bought an electric one where they get electrocuted that's that's worse huh 
But at least it's inside a case. So at least we, we don't see it. We just pick up the case and throw it away. This, you'll see the head chopped off, right? But so what we do is we make, we make Christianity. Some of you guys are like, Pee is really into these plush toys. Like, so it's because I'm, I'm bored, guys. I'm bored. So this is really, we got to be careful. So, so what, what is the, the act of worship of removing unleavened bread? Okay. So we go, okay, I got, I got nasty things. I got unwanted things. I got things that make other things in my house and life diseased. It could potentially harm us. So what do we do? We get these traps. We get these traps and we go, I'm going to catch these nasty, sinful things. Come on, somebody. Right? And so we lay it out all throughout the house. Right? Like right now my house is literally... <laughs> It's, we, we're going to get trapped by these things, right? And so we're hoping one night, just one night, I want to, ooh, you think you got me? Ooh, like, you think, I, ooh, you think, ooh, I'm going to get you, ooh, you, you, oh, right? And then we're like, you think you were smart? We're going to, and then we, we put a little, like, cheese or, like, peanut butter. They say peanut butter really works well. And we're, oh, I want to catch you. It's a season of unleavened bread, Right? That was the scariest illustration ever. Okay? And so we, kill, we try to kill them, and we're like, yes! We're like, yes! We got them. And then we show you, hey, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of these nasty things. Right? But can I tell you something? This, this, even though it's satisfying, Right? We caught it. We caught our sinful behaviors. This is satisfying. But this does not guarantee that more of these guys will not return. Actually, I heard that there was a, a mice in this, this building, actually. If you think about it. If you listen carefully enough, you'll see. You see that? It's so... If you look carefully underneath, there's a mice right there. They will come back. That was the lamest illustration I ever did. You guys were supposed to jump out of your seats and freak out, right? So lame, guys. You guys are all looking at it like, anyways. So I want you to see this. No matter how many times we trap and, and, and catch these things, they have the potential to come back as long as this is here. Do you hear me? As long as leaven is in the house, no matter how much you try, they will come back. You see, worship is not sin management. Worship is deep repentance. Worship is not, I'll try to not do this anymore, Lord. Worship is not, I'm, I, I don't like how this looks on me, Lord. I don't like the, how this smells or makes things. Worship is creating me a clean heart, oh God. Lord, what is it in me that keeps, that keeps wanting this in my life? Lord, create in me a clean heart. Help me to find the leaven and not just the sinful acts. So, what is worship? Worship. So you here, I'm going to give you a statement here. Worship is removing all the leaven in your life. Each week, I'm going to give you a statement of worship so you will know for sure what worship is, okay? So when someone asks you, what do Christians consider worship? You can say, one of the ways we worship is we remove the leaven in our lives, okay? We repent of our sinful heart and and lives, okay? Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's get our communion cups out.
No, I should listen to my staff more. So funny because my staff's like, this this part is really great, PB, but releasing the mice throughout the sanctuary is lame. Okay, fine. All right, let's do communion together. Take it out. <clears throat> With your eyes closed, I'm going to read scripture over you in light of today's word before we take the body and the blood of our Lord. It says in 1 Corinthians, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread unleavened, with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So here we are today, Lord. Hmm. We're wanting to be a new batch. We're wanting to be free of leaven, Lord. We know that this new life, this leaven-free heart starts with you. We know that one of our acts of worship is to clean house, but, but that new house you have given to us, the sacrifice on the cross, you've given us a new home, a home without leaven. But Lord, we're still learning to live the new way, and we end up bringing in a lot of leaven into this new home. And we're asking you right now for the courage to go look for them. The passion and and the love and devotion to uproot them and to confess them and to remove them. Thank you, God, that in your spirit we can do this. The body of our Lord broken for you in this world. Take and eat. The blood of the lamb shed for our sins. Take and drink. The body and the blood of Jesus Christ, the only hope for our world, let us pray. Thank you, Lord. You are the only hope for this world. I pray, Father, that you be with every family in Ukraine right now. How the leaven of man has grown so uncontrollably that it leads to wars and killing of children. God, we repent as part of as part of humanity so attracted to Pharaoh's ways. Even though we're thousands of miles away, Lord, um, we feel their suffering. And we ask you right now to have mercy. Protect them. Protect them from the evil one. 
I pray for the soldiers on both sides, especially the Russian soldiers. God, that they will all of a sudden notice the leaven in their own hearts. It will cause them to lay down their arms. I pray, God, for reconciliation. Holy Spirit, visit both camps mightily. I pray for revival in the platoons. I pray for conviction. I pray for conscience, a consciousness to, to arise. They will see the, a brother and sister in the other. Have mercy over them. As we enter the season of Lent, we as a church, we say, we're not free from guilt, Lord. We have contributed to many things, God, that uh, rises to wars itself. So I ask you right now, help us see the leaven in us, help us to locate it, and help us to corporately get rid of it. We thank you for this tangible teaching. We want to worship you well, Lord. We want to know that we've been loving you well. We love you, Jesus. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May Christ be victorious in your lives. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, guys. We will see you Tuesday for our Ash Wednesday service. Amen.